Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Cody DeQuisto. I work in the hunting industry, designing and producing gear for people who want to hunt the mobile style, mobile fashion. I've been immersed in mobile hunting my entire life. And today on the Shields Outdoor Podcast, we're going to go over some whitetail tactics. Welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast, your source for information on hunting, fishing, and all of your outdoor passions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast. My name is Mike Anderson, and today we're going to be talking whitetail. We're about two months away from the start of many seasons, and now's the time to start thinking about what gear you have, what gear you need, finding your target bucks, and it's just a really exciting time for us whitetail hunters. Today we have with us Cody DeKisto of XOP Stance. He's going to talk to us about his unique perspective on hunting and mobile hunting and a lot of products that can really help you along the way. Cody, thank you for joining us today. For those that don't know you, can you uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became so passionate with hunting? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. First off, it's a, it's always a pleasure to get on, uh, support Shields in any way. And um, man, I'm always up to talk whitetails. Uh, so just a little background about me. I pretty much was born and raised into whitetail hunting in that scene, if you will. My, my old man, Andre DeQuisto, was actually the founder of Lone Wolf Portable Tree Stands. He started that company many, many years ago uh, in 1984. So my entire life, I've came up just submerged in whitetail hunting. I, I you know, worked in the shop as a kid building tree stands. And as soon as I could walk, I was dragged in the woods and... Um, it's been a pretty smooth transition in that sense, you know, coming into, you know, adulthood, you know, with a lot of years of, of hunting under my belt. Um, I started to work for a company called Extreme Outdoor Products and started designing stands and products much like his original ones with a lot of, uh, you know, some innovation and changes to those. And even fast forwarding years now, we have another line of products called Lone Wolf Custom Gear that is stuff even more dived into mobile orientated and efficiency when hunting whitetails. So, um, I enjoy that. It's my passion and, um, the products really lend their hand to a successful hunt and just getting it done out there. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah. There's just some, just some really incredible innovation and, and thought that's, that's gone into a lot of that stuff. So how did you just, how did you kind of develop that style of thinking with, uh, with your hunting and both your products? So where I, where I'm a little lucky in that sense is that when I started hunting from the get go, I didn't go through a transition like a lot of others do in which, you know, they might've came up in a different style hunting, you know, just stationary stands or hunting box blinds or ladders. Um, because a lot of the, what you hear out there is people make that transition and they find that a little later in their hunting career that they need to start moving around and getting more proactive to be successful um, and start harvesting more deer. Well, when I first started hunting, it was with lone wolf stands and it was with products that my old man designed for the purpose that he caught on to that way, way early in the game that being mobile, um, being proactive in the woods really led to success and deer on the ground. So being that I started in that fashion, my entire whitetail career has been hunting that way. And where I kind of, I almost feel like I've taken it to another level because starting from there, I'm like, okay, well, why not go to the extreme? I've always been that sort of guy, you know, against the grain type of like really go 110% at whatever I'm doing. So over the course of these years now, I mean, I I don't even know how long it's been, how many years, but over the course of my entire career uh, or hunting career, I've been consistently 
getting more mobile and just trying to fine tune that that system you know we're all about having a system for hunting and in my i think if i had to give one person if i have to get somebody a tip and where i come down to is efficiency right so the more efficient you can be to keep yourself in the woods and keep yourself going the more success you're going to have um consistently being out there and being able to do that efficiently is going to lead to more deer on the ground ultimately so um i gravitate toward lighter setups less gear i have a very minimalistic approach to hunting if you've seen what i took in the woods you'd probably be jaw dropped because it's essentially nothing um and it's just all about that quick burst of um of hunting you know Mm -hmm. very cool yeah i mean complacency can be a true enemy when you're in the whitetail woods you know like whether it's you know, I was putting your cameras in the same spot or I was hunting the same spot, burning things out, like deer are creatures of habit, but you know, like you can educate them pretty quickly. So how do you find that balance between like aggression and moving around versus like educating the animals? So I'm a big believer that I've always been the type probably over aggressive if you'd say anything so now there is a method to the madness i don't go you know with the intent to just completely tromp a property but one thing that people don't realize about whitetails is yes you can pressure them and yes you can um you can be detrimental like or what is the word you used uh um i'm trying to think educate you used educate right Mm -hmm. or not educate them so you can educate them and you can definitely, you know, um, I can't find the words today. It's all about the way in which you do it. If you are going out to hunt a whitetail and you badger him and you're in the woods with him trying to get it done, he will accept that. He'll take that. If you consistently badger that animal and pressure that animal and, and push that animal out of where he's living and, on a consistent basis over and over again, you are going to educate them and they're going to leave. They won't stay there. But a common misconception has always been that people are scared to get close to the animal for a fear of them leaving and never coming back and them never seeing them again. And that's just pretty much straight. It's just false. Um, if you do it repeatedly, it can be detrimental, but if you do it strategically and you are just trying to, find out that deer's location then so what you're actually doing diving deeper deeper into it is when you when you find a deer and where he's living and you get close to him right and even if you scare him off if you bump him they call it all that's really going to do is it's gonna it's gonna actually make that deer feel better for a short period of time because that deer knows where he's at and what he's doing is working for him. Mm-hmm. That's all that's doing. It's like it's like you're almost assuring him that he's safe. Does that make sense? So if, you know, it'd be like, you know, almost like, okay, I got this bomb shelter, right, or something, or I got this storm shelter. And every time a storm comes, I run in that storm shelter. If the first time I ran in that storm shelter, you know, the doors blew off and a tree came in there, you know, or, or every time I ran in there that happened, I'd probably stop using that shelter. But if a storm comes, I run in there, it passes by, I come back out, everything's fine, nothing ever happens. I feel warm and fuzzy. I feel like I got a safe spot to go when the storm comes. And that's how they feel about these areas. They're bedding in these areas for a reason. And they, you know, they establish that home base because they're not stupid they know it's good for them for predators and they can escape. So if you allow them that escape, that right there in their mind is, Oh, that worked out fine. It worked out just like I wanted it to. I got away. I'm safe. That's, that's a safe place to bed, which allows you an awesome opportunity to capitalize and then hunt him in that area. So that, that premise right there is, is, really what I revolve around or my hunting style, it really gravitates back to bedding 
And now there's a there's a big craze with betting nowadays, and it doesn't have to be about betting. So many people are so obsessed with where white are betting and what they're doing that it's almost like they that's all they're thinking about and they're blinded. It doesn't have to be that. If you can capitalize on another area or another pattern, you know, if you know where they're feeding, if you know other things they're doing, it's all about intercepting that deer's pattern. So, um, but where you can really get close and tight and is if you find out where they're betting, even if you don't badger that area or push it too deep, that's a huge key piece to the puzzle. Um, when going after uh, whitetail in general or a specific book. Okay. That's definitely an interesting thought process. So, um, you know, if you, if you bump a buck, you're not giving up on that, correct? Absolutely not. So I'll, I'll go in the woods trying to bump a buck most times. Um, now if, cause that there's just this common misconception. It's just been happening. It's been talked about for so long. Like there's, there's a laundry list of things that are just complete BS that you'll hear in the mainstream media that I, you know, that's one of the big things about this mobile on a road show that I'm doing is I get out and I'm trying to educate these people who are looking to be more mobile and looking to find more success in the whitetail woods. I, I try and give them a different way of thinking and a different thought process is the same thing goes into hunting heights. There's been this common misconception for so long that like, you have to be 20 feet up in a tree in a tree stand. And it's just something that, that was like birthed years ago that like, Oh yep, 20 feet, 20 feet where you need to be. That's stand height, you know? And it's, I, for, Oh, for many, many years now, I've been consistently killing deer at seven to 12 feet and I kill. And now it's actually become, it's my favorite thing to do. You know, my, my thing now is I try and get as low and as close as humanly possible in a tree stand to these animals. And, and just this past year, I shot two deer at nine feet off the ground, under 15 yards away in different states, um, you know, different hunts, different scenarios. So it's, it, it, there's a lot of things that are set out there. Some more myths out there. I just to touch on another one while we're kind of jumping around the whole morning thing or the October lull, the, the, the idea or the concept behind there's this point in October where deer don't move or that's bad to hunt. That is the biggest piece of BS I've ever heard. Some of the best hunting you can, you can have is in early and mid October. And, um, it's just, it's been, it's this, it's this thing that arised out of nowhere from guys who didn't know what they were doing, who couldn't get it done, who then said, Oh yeah, it's a, it's a shitty time to hunt, you know, wait till, wait till November. So, um, there's a lot of that. And bumping deer is probably one on that, that, that hot list along with stand height and the October lull and morning hunting. And, you know, there's a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just requires a different style of thinking. Yes, exactly. It's, it's, it, you know, people are so conditioned. And when you think of whitetail hunting and you think of what you see um, or what you want to do, they, everybody's got this thought of, November action and like field edges and bucks fighting and bucks chasing does and, and, you know, bucks tearing up trees or, or whatnot, or like even this, and everybody's trying to experience that. And of of course you're not going to experience that in October, but that does not mean that October is a lulled time. That just means there's, there's no rut activity going on in this time of October. It's just so many people bank, on deer getting squirrely to be able to kill them instead of actually hunting them. And what I've been obsessed with over my, my entire, from little on, like, like what has drove me is not shooting my bow. I hardly ever shoot my bow. It's not, you know, anything. It's the actual act of the hunt. It's the going into the woods. Like I look at it as like this, this mystery, right? Like, so I'm I'm going in there and the, the, the idea is to find out, where there's a good buck, find out exactly what he's doing and then sneak in there and then be successful at harvesting that deer or a good deer. Like, it's just, you know, maybe it's like this, this, this primal thing that I'm obsessed with, but like the fact of that in the actual hunt, it's one thing too, that's led me to like really not use cameras anymore and not, you know, there's just so much things now that are taking away the act of hunting that, you know, just kind of, they muddy up the whole experience. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, 
that's kind of where where I'm at with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's just really bow hunting in its truest form, you know, just that primal instinct. That's, it's very interesting the way you're talking about, you know, like it, it is easier to kill a buck during the rut because they're, you know, like they're actively searching, moving for does, but to, uh, you know, to kill one during that so-called October lull, like that, that definitely takes a challenge and it takes some woodsmanship. So what I'm curious yep. about is how you, how you go about attacking in, in during that time period what are you doing differently so actually you know you'd be you might be surprised to know this but people laugh when i tell them this but out of all the deer that i've, I've harvested and and i got a lot of deer on the wall only i think two of them have ever been shot in november because i'm such a so one thing about me is i'm i'm very i'm a very uh structure oriented person and like uh I'm like routine and you know, like, uh, e even my days, if they don't go a certain way, I'm all screwed up. And I, I wake up, I do this, I, you know, go to the gym. I, I, you know, so when I enter, I can relate. I, I use that and I try and relate to deer early season or late season or October. And I know that all these deer are the same way. They're creatures of habit. They have their, they have their patterns. They have their routines. They have their things they're doing. Now things change all the time they change food sources. They might change travel patterns due to that food source change. They might change bedding due to a, a situation or something that happens or the weather. But when they change, there's always that, I feel like with, with whitetail, there's always that need for a structure and a routine. Like it's, it's hardly ever fly by night. So knowing that I try and key on those things. So when November rolls around, to me, it's like, it, it just makes me go go batshit because there's no rhyme or reason. It's literally, it becomes like, instead of me focusing on patterns and finding things and trying to like solve a puzzle, it just becomes like, okay, well, let's just go out and sit in a good spot that a doe might walk through or that like a buck is going to be cruising to, you know, but there is literally no way to pattern November. Even like if you're in a good pinch or if you're, you're on the downwind side of a good bedding area, you don't know for sure that the buck you're after is going to come through there or that a buck is going to come through there checking that bedding area. You can, you can make those assumptions, but you know, on, in other times of the year, like if I find a more bucks bedding or where he's feeding or, or these travel patterns, like, you know, those are sure things. Those are things that have been done. And, um, I've went through November's and didn't see anything. And I've, you know, I've had better, you know, October's and, it's just such a crapshoot at that point in time that it's a free for all. Now you see some really cool stuff, but as far as like killing a specific deer, well, specific deer is very hard, but killing a lot of people kill because a lot of people are just going out there and sitting and you're almost, I think people give me, it sounds kind of crazy, but even someone who's so in tune with whitetail hunting and what they do. And like, um, I consider myself a pretty good hunter and figuring that out. I would be the first to tell you if somebody's like, Hey, where should I sit in November? I'd be like, you know what? Throw a dart at the map. <laughs> like, and, and they're like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, honestly, cause that's all I can tell you because literally them does, there's no way to tell what does are going to come in. I mean, you can put yourself in a heavy populated doe area, but there's just no way of telling. There's no way of telling what's going to come in first or, or what you just got to be out there. And most people are just going out and hanging stands in November, not knowing here nor there. And they end up shooting a Magnum. You know, so it's, it's, it's one of those things where, um, it's, it's just, you know, it's like, you need to just fasten up and buckle in for the ride at that point in time. But I mean, you can definitely do things to help out your success. If you're not seeing stuff in November, that's where being mobile comes in handy because you, you should always be moving. You know, November is a crazy time. If you're not seeing anything, it's happening. It's just not happening where you're at. So you need to move, you know, but aside from just being mobile and moving consistently in that time of year, it's pretty much kind of just like a, a, you know, a bomb exploding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So what kind of areas are you, are you targeting when you're, you know, sort of like dissecting a new property? So it, depending on, and this is, this is going to vary quite a bit depending on where I'm at and how big the property is and, and what I know about it. Um, cause I'll try and do as much research as I can before I go to a new property or a new piece of ground or, or, 
and try and figure out. But first of all, you know, I want to look at the area. I want to look at access. I want to know that I can access the spots to hunt them because a big, a big piece of the puzzle that people don't look at is access. And, and I'm talking access from all sorts of facets, like, uh, you know, accessing, you know, for one, like the ability to access, even having like, some pieces are landlocked some pieces don't offer access from certain areas and you might have to go through deer to to get to a place you want to hunt other places might have access but it's super tough access and it's like you know like you, you're killing yourself just to get back to a spot um the way the property is laid out with like primary winds like if you you know you can you can look at the primary winds of an area and if a property is laid out to where like your access is going to be upwind from like all these like major areas that you're going to be scouting and hunting like that that's number one to me because there's a lot of pieces that i'll just x off just due to access um unless you know what would trump that is if somebody gave if i had a lead or i seen a deer that was like a really good deer then i'd find a way to make it work but like i go back down the beginning it's it's how for how long of a time can you efficiently hunt this piece and if you know there's a lot of guys who will find awesome spots and they're hiking up mountains and stuff and they'll only have the, the stamina to do it once or twice or three times and they're burnt out you know so first i look at access um access is a huge piece of the puzzle then you know once i once i've established that okay yeah th this i can hunt this piece i will really want to get my eyes on every every spot every piece because or uh, every you know and if that's a you know, 10,000 acre piece, it's going to take a lot longer than if it's a, you know, 50 acre piece, obviously, but I'm a big advocate too. Like a lot of people claim that they can find out all this valuable information from, from e-scouting. I, I'm going to call BS on that because I've, I've found bucks in spots that you would have absolute, like you would never think there's a buck there and there's no way to tell on an aerial where a buck's bedded or where mm -hmm. deer are at, unless you're looking, you know, I mean, you, aside from maybe like there's guys who will look at aerials from different times of the year. And if there's no foliage on the tree and you're in a swamp, like, and you zoom in, yeah, you can start picking out beds. Like you can do stuff like that, but I don't like to go off of past information anyway, because everything changes all the time. That buck or those deer that were there last year might not be bedding there. They might be, but the only way you're going to know is if you see it and find it. So, I try and do very minimal aerial scouting aside from, you know, maybe narrowing down my first pick. Like if it is November, you can a lot of times see good pinches on aerial. Um, but as far as finding other type of deer, it's about getting on that ground, walking around, um, using that good access that you've previously found. Yep, there's no substitute for boots on the ground. And, and there is definitely value in e-scouting like finding areas, finding areas that you can, you know, get access to hunt, knowing, knowing your public stuff and whatnot, or b figuring out what doors to knock on, things like that. But, you know, like I've, I've hunted North Dakota quite a bit. A lot of the stuff where there's like no trees, it's just sloughs. And you'd be amazed how big a bucks will sit in like a quarter acre slough sitting in the middle of a field because that's a piece of cover and he can see anywhere and you can guarantee that no one can touch him because he's going to see you from a half a mile away. And, and that's the thing, like, that's where, you know, that first point that like that access point is going to be like done on an aerial standpoint, like, because that's really the only way you're going to be able to tell about access. So, you know, look at the map, look at the surrounding properties, look at the acreage you're working with, look at, um, you know, so that, and then, the second portion to that, um, and then, yeah, seeing borders, all that kind of stuff. Like, there's there's no substitute for aerial when it comes to that thing. But then when it actually comes, like, once I've, once I've actually locked down the piece and picked it, then that's where I stop focusing on the aerial. And then mm -hmm. it's like, okay, all right, this is what I'm going to look at. This is what I'm going to dive into. And, um, and also, too, like, you know, especially when you get in, like, public ground or or, or big areas like parking like you know there's not always somewhere you can just park and then access from even that spot that you found so then it becomes like this this process of like all right well there's only this parking area then i gotta get to this point which could be 
you know, that could be the difference of like, okay, do I need to bring my pedal bike? Do I need to, you know, do I need to freaking do three miles on the gravel road before I dump into the timber? And, and all that is a really, really specific piece of the puzzle. And then, um, then going in from there is where the, the real work is done and, and boots on the ground and looking at stuff. And, um, especially depending on where you are too. I remember similar to you're talking in, in North Dakota and I've never hunted North Dakota. I was actually going to go there last year, but I had some stuff come up, but I kind of, I can, from what you said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, um, relating that to when I hunted, uh, Kansas a few years back. And when mm-hmm. I got there, I'm used to, I'm used to big timber, like a lot of trees, a lot of timber thickets. Like I hunt, I kill a lot of deer in very thick cover, very close quarter. And when I got down there, I was just looking for timber and I'm like, Oh my God, there's, there's no timber down here. Like, yep. I, like it was, I was, you know, beyond that. And I'm like, you would, you'd be surprised you know? how similar that is to actually hunting big timber. Like they don't look the same, you know, like you've got big trees versus sloughs, but you know, like to a deer covers cover and it's a yeah. big area of cover. You just need to learn how to, how to dissect and apply to like, what you've had successes with in the past. And I just, I want to touch on like your entry and exit routes. I'm glad you brought that up first. Cause like the, I've been bow hunting for a decent amount of time now, you know, like 25 years or so. And the one thing I've learned the most is your entry and exit routes are crucial, you know, from a, from like, I mean, to a certain extent, educating a deer standpoint, but like knowing how other people are accessing it too. And you can play that to your advantage. Like if I know there's a parking area here and all the, and and, you know, like they're walking in, in this certain spot, like if I come in in a different area or if I know deer are probably going to avoid that because they're getting bumped like every other day, you can totally use that to your advantage. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a good example. Like going back to that first point, the the entry and exit routes can really screw you up like if you even if you're hunting but you start entering wrong and you're you're badgering those deer every day day in day out like or every time you go in there they very quick start to learn that and then they start to pattern you and they will leave if they you know if they don't want to you know over over it's hard to say because all deer are different how long they'll actually take it or 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 you know be okay with that but that's where you got to be smart in into having a better idea or knowing knowing at least somewhat where these deer are and then being able to not pressure them on the way way in and way out or or not let them know that Mm -hmm. so i'm i'm curious about your setups and what you're looking for when you're actually in the woods like you got your boots on the ground stuff like what sort of sign are you looking for? What makes you just like that light bulb click? Like, okay, yep, I need to be in this area. I need to have a stand hung up here. This is where I'm going to be. So I think it would first be, um, I think it would first be deer in general. Um, I want, it, this all varies too, based on where I'm at, because if I'm hunting somewhere that has like virtually no deer population, or if I'm hunting to somewhere where I know there's a lot of deer, that's going to change a little bit because like, um, big, big, vast pieces to where there might only be a couple deer per square mile. Like I need to find where those couple deer are. I need to, I'm looking for food sources that they're, that they're actively hitting and just trying to eliminate ground or eliminate places not to be, uh, on areas that have more deer. I'm looking for a little better, better sign to be there like you know maybe uh more tracks you know bigger tracks um just any any piece of evidence that that one is there like i've i've hunted i've hunted hunted single tracks before i've hunted single beds um you know i as you get later in october and and deer start to get a little more squirrely like you know scrapes are really good to to capitalize on, um, to get a buck, uh, buck down in that time, especially when they're starting to, um, they're starting to feel that, that pressure in November's right around the corner. Um, but anything that's going to tip me off to that potential pattern or that potential, um, or it's potentially being inhabited by a buck. So not all deer or bucks, like 
shred the hell out of the woods. You know, I mean, everybody, you know, it's a lot of times people are walking around looking for just like, you know, garbage can size rubs and, mm-hmm. and, you know, just like a whole 50 acre or 50 yard square piece of timber that's just shredded. It just doesn't always happen that way. You know, I mean, you might get a hint of something, a small little, little rub on a, uh, um, on a hedgerow line leading out to a food source, a, a good track in the mud, you know, deeper on a creek bottom, just down from that, that said, said rub. And then, a you know, a bed on the ridge, you know, with a good wind within a half mile from that, you know, and then you can start to kind of piece. I like to piece an entire piece together and like an entire picture more so versus one piece of sign. So everything that I'm collecting as I, as I hunt and as I go in and throughout the season is all being like stored in this bank of knowledge for that year. As soon as that year is done, or like, uh, you know, or even even sections of the year, like I'll do that for October and then that'll like it'll get reset for November and then it'll get reset for late season. And then it all of that just gets completely reset for the following year. But it's like taking all those pieces of information and banking those to then accumulatively use them to then it's like a, a system of a process of elimination versus like, OK, what sign do I want to be hunting? Where do I want to focus on? And then you just you just keep like keep hatching it at it, you know, and then um, keep going from there. If that makes sense, it's kind of I, I haven't talked to many people throughout the years that that look at it that way. Everybody's like looking for something and they're hunting somewhere and they're looking for something. I'm I'm looking to figure out the entire picture. So even if it's those that are doing something or if it's small bucks or if whatever, I want to get my I, I always. I got this, this coin phrase, like, I want to keep my finger on the pulse of the property. And then that will allow me to slide in then and target a buck that I'm after or get a look at a buck that I'm after, then go deeper from there. So it's, it's always a process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, it's a great way to look at it, especially when you're targeting mature deer. Like I know from past experiences, like you get yourself on a rub line or a scrape line and stuff. You think, oh, that looks good. You know, throw a trail camera on there. And, you know, it's like a two and a half year old eight point buck. It's like, you know, th- those ones are the bucks that like have something to prove. They're like, hey, I want to kind of strut my stuff. But then when you when you look at the mature ones, you know, a lot of times they're not the ones making that you know, big scrape, maybe they're, they're just the ones, you know, maybe a little one off to the side on a trail or stuff like that. Yeah. It's so, it's so, and that's another thing. Like, yeah, I've been, you can be fooled by all that stuff. Um, it's, it all, so it really comes down to temperament at that point in time. And, and I've seen tiny bucks make huge sign and, and big, and giant bucks make virtually no sign. So, I mean, it doesn't, there's been so many times where I was hunting an area that I thought I was getting closer to a, a buck that I wanted to shoot. And then it, it just wasn't like, and it's like, man, oh, what the heck? And I've also seen uh, like on the hoof, big deer get ran off by just these, these little bullies, you know? And like, it just, it just goes to the fact like they don't know what's on their head. That's all testosterone production and how they, it's just like, just like you or me, like, you know, you know, you might be prone to get in a scrap at a bar more than I would. You know, I mean, it, it's 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 one of those things where some people avoid it. Some people go for it. Um, some people feel the need to mark their territory. Some people know that they, they don't need to. So it's all about just figuring it out. I, I've, I can think of instances in the past to where there was there were deer that were on properties that I hunted that were so dominant. Had I wanted to kill them, it had been so easy because they were just they were that dominant that they even got pissed that I was there. And they knew that I was like, you know, a, a human or whatever. And like, and I, I would have, I remember setting up, a, setting up a stand one time and literally I could hear this deer just breaking, just busting up branches below me on a ridge. And he could hear me and he could smell me. He was downwind and he knew it was me. And he was just like making a statement, like, like <laughs> this is my house, you know? I mean, so, had, you know, that deer wasn't actually that, that big of a deer. It was like a bully heavy, um, you know, deer and there was bigger ones that I was hunting, but, um, had I wanted to pursue that deer, you know, I would have been very, it probably would have been very easy to kill that one just because he wouldn't have been as timid and, and as likely to just take off, 
because he had more of a, you know, lockdown on his area. Like I probably could have hiked at that point in time, backed out, came around him, did a loop, got very close to him on the down or on the upwind side, um, and then set up and probably just made a little noise and he'd have came out, came in and check it out, mm-hmm. you know, and that would have been a scenario that, and I've actually done things like that in the past and it just freaking works. Like it works great. But those things don't come out, don't come around that often because it, you don't always know a deer temperament. Like, you know, if they, if they show their hands sometimes like that, well, then you can, you know, you can utilize that to your advantage and, and capitalize on it. But that's a very, very rare scenario. Yeah, that's that's some great information. And you can definitely tell you have a an interesting and, and unique thought process. And, and a lot of that really comes out in, uh, you know, in a lot of the products you design. So what are a, what are a couple ones that have either just come out or, or will be coming out soon that you're super excited about and, and feel like can be real difference makers for you in the woods? Okay, so when it comes down to designing and developing products for this style of hunting, I've said it time and time and again, it all really comes back to that one word, efficiency. So being that we want to hunt as efficient as possible, I design products to not only, well, not only a single product, but to work together as a system to allow guys to quickly hang, quickly break down, quietly set up, and so on and so, so forth. So a couple of unique products that we have uh, that really benefit to this to this style of hunting. Um, new ones for this year on the XOP side of things. Um, everything has been broken down and redesigned. Um, and our Ultra Series sticks is probably one of the most things I'm excited about in that line, as well as some of our smaller accessories. But the Ultra Series sticks are a lightweight, compact as running gun as it gets type of climbing stick they lock together sideways uh, so they minimize the profile off your back they integrate and strap right onto the back of your stand with ease they're small their profile is very um uh very small in the fact that they're not outside of your body shape they can be attached to the tree very easily they're very stable and lightweight so these new upgrades i think we've we've shaved about a half pound per stick off these new models. Uh, we have the new stacking capabilities and they still offer all the same, same great benefits and features of, you know, like our longer step, our, our secure V bracket to the tree. So they're very, very stout. Not only that, like with XOP, the name of the game has always been to offer those high quality products at more of an affordable price point, uh, you know, for, really to get new hunters into this style. So uh, those new ultra sticks coming in at 149.99 is is really going to help that out I think and it's going to allow people you know to have a good climbing stick to uh, to pair with their tree stand. Um, those along with one of our vanish hang-ons is is my go-to setup on the XOP line. It the vanish hang-on is pretty cut and dry. It has all platform and seat leveling capabilities. It's lightweight, lifetime warranty, all cast aluminum, ultra quiet, and it really functions um, really functions like a mobile stand should. So, as far as XOP goes, those would be um, uh, those would be the products that I would recommend looking at for this style. And I, I do love those new sticks. You know, like I, I was at Archery University. It's where where I first ran into you. And just the way that they lock onto the stand, you can lock them in like the, the traditional style where they go on top of each other, or you can lock them sideways. And then even like the, the stand where the seat cushion flips over. So then it prevents any creaking, you know, like when you're walking in and out, just, it's, it's really cool. All the, all the thought and the design that goes into this. Cause I can just, I can imagine myself talking to my hunting buddy, like when we're just rambling on about deer strategy and stuff and like, Oh, I can't, you know, we should make this happen or we should make that happen. You can just tell like a lot of that is going on behind the scenes with the products that you guys make. Yeah. That that's the key right there is really there, you know, it's sad, but there's a lot of people out there that are in, you know, positions or designing things. And, and you can always tell who is using the stuff 
and who is really putting in the repetitions because that's when you see those little those little features and those little things pop up that we've all been frustrated with and and it really makes you appreciate that so we we try uh, you know i try to beat everything up as much as possible and really give it a lot of field time personally and it just really allows me like yep this needs to be changed just a little bit or that needs to be changed a little bit or like if this could just be you know this much smaller or 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 this much better you know it it really lens for um just an overall better product and, and that seat cushion is a prime example of that such a s- stupid simple thing but it solves such a big problem and nobody else is doing things like that so that like those are the the real the real uh, treasures inside the product line mm-hmm, absolutely i mean granted it's important to shave a half pound here or there when you're walking in 10 miles but like just a little, a little notch and being able to flip over that seat. Like now I know I'm quieter when I go in. Now I know I'm going to be more comfortable. That seat's not moving when I'm up getting ready to draw back. It's wild. And then there was, there was another little product you showed is it, um, it clips onto your belt. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So that's actually, that's another, that I'm really excited about that one. I've been field testing that one all year. So what that is, it's, we're calling it a climbing stick holster. So it works with, the attachment buttons on your climbing stick and you can clip those onto your belt onto your pack onto your safety harness you can put them directly onto the frame of your stand and these hold your climbing stick while you're ascending up the tree and the way they're designed is they actually spin on an axis so your stick can't fall out of them but they're always there right at your side so when you're going up the tree it's nice and safe and easy you can just reach over take that off put it right to the tree instead of having to go up and down or, or rig a stick in your pocket or, or, you know, stuff a belt in your pocket and all that kind of kind of deal. So those are going to be very, when you start talking efficiency, just the, just the addition of something that small, that little accessory will shave so much crucial time off your setup and breakdown that like, it's just, you know, th- th- that's what you want. You know, you get that, mm-hmm. you get more time, quicker setup. Yeah. So, I mean, cause you were, you were showing off all these products, which are awesome. I mean, everything from like your bags with the Molly systems to, you know, strap everything down to the new, like, you know, saddle platform to the stands, to the sticks, but just the, that little swiveling piece. Like I just thought to myself, like, why was that not thought of years ago? Cause everyone has that issue, you know, like you're climbing up, you know, setting up your sticks, you know, you get the first ones always the easiest, you know, like you're just yeah. on the ground, you're yep. set up, you got it. But then, you know, like you go up to your second and your third and your fourth, you're like, have it over your shoulder, fumbling around they're clanking and stuff. It's like, you lock it right onto your hip, you know, like you can even attach like your three sticks there because of the way the system's set up. And then you just grab the next one, strap it on. And even from like a safety standpoint too, because then like, you know, you can, you can be harnessed onto the tree or whatever. Ever. And then that, you know, like your sticks are to the side and it's just, like you said, total efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like you said too, above, it can be, you know, when you start dealing with your, your climbing harness and your, and your system and the way you're going up. And especially if you're, if you're very close to a deer or you're, you know, you're trying to be as stealthy as possible, like just eliminating just even if it's just one trip up and down, I mean, you know, but what's nice about that is you can rig one on both sides and you can even rig, you know, one on the back of your climbing harness too. Like you can have those, those, you know, easily available. And if you also, like, if you do the math too, the more messing around up and down you're doing, you know, the, or, or the less, I mean, the safer, you know, the safer it is. You just, you know, it's nice and it's quick. It's one shot. It's efficient. And, you know, you're not sweating and you're not getting pissed and you know so it just makes that makes life a lot easier yeah absolutely i mean that that perfectly reminds me of a time when when i was hunting it was it was thanksgiving so we just had thanksgiving dinner and i still have my deer tag and i'm like okay it's a i got time i want to get out there like I, i go to the like the edge of this field next to a swamp i know the deer don't have to go very far and I get there and, you know, like I go one trip up, get my stand set up and, you know, like 
I had to go back down to get my bow. I'd forgotten a, I'd forgotten a rope. And I get down, I grab my bow, and I get halfway up the tree, and all of a sudden I look in front of me, and a doe gets pushed at 20 yards, and behind her is, at that time, the biggest buck I'd ever seen in my life. You know, he's <laughs> all of 160, and you know, there he's staring at me at 20, 25 yards. Like, if I would have been five minutes faster, or if I would have remembered a rope, if I would have been more efficient, like, that deer's right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> man that yeah that that sucks right there i mean that that's i'm you know any of us who have been hunting long enough have experienced some some stuff like that but yeah that right there it's the same same concept you know like it just that few minutes of difference makes all or that few minutes can make the world a difference um quite often i mean it, it's it happens more than you think to where it's like and, and you look at that and i know it's you know and it's important too to not rush in something like that like you know when you're setting up a stand and you're setting up, you know, and you're in an elevated position and you're in a tree, like you don't want to be rushing. Mm -hmm. um, Cause yeah, so, that sound is going to carry, you know, they're, yeah, they could, and, and you know, like they're going to hear important. you a lot farther than you're going to be able to see them. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's where it's just, it's, it's so important to just be as efficient as you can. Uh, and that's too, even where like another one of our products comes into play too, like the, the offset quick connect bracket. So we have the only quick connect system that has leveling capability and, and we have various slots with different degrees of angle in there. So these are, are, are just awesome for if you have predetermined stand locations and you want to do be a little bit more mobile, like there's plenty of guys out there. And this is, a, this is an awesome, affordable way to efficiently hunt like a, a, a piece of private ground too. You can buy 10 or 12 of those brackets Go out, set up predetermined locations, you know, whether you leave sticks or screw-ins in there or not. But then you at least know that that stand is in the spot it needs to be. And you can very quickly climb up the tree and then just drop that right into the slot with mm -hmm. no no question. So you drop it in and then your stand is in its spot and you, you, there's no, you know, I guess time or you don't have to waste any time leveling or adjusting anything and you just know it's right. So yeah, that's, that's, that's really such a huge benefit for like, mul like, especially like you said, private land that you hunt year in year out, like, you know, certain areas that you want to hunt, but like, so, okay, you can go and set that bracket, you can trim your stuff. So then like, I know all I got to do is put that stand in there and then it helps burn out too. You know, like you're not sitting yeah. in that same spot time after time, you got 12 of those up, like you're, you're moving and grooving, you're staying in the game. And it's also super popular, like, you know, on the opposite end of the spectrum with, with public land, because technically you're not supposed to leave any stands. Mm -hmm. But with this, this being just a, just a strap, essentially, you know, it'll allow guys to be able to, with one stand on their back, do a lot of excessive scouting, um, you know, maybe right before the season or even in the season, but they get out there and let's say you go scout a thousand acre piece, you can go set or mock set up at least, you know, as many as you want. Let's say, let's say you want to, you know, four quadrants of the property you want to throw an observation sit at. Well then just, you know, and you take just four brackets and you leave them there and then you can just hike in, know that that bracket's where it's at, especially like not being able to trim. Mm -hmm. So that's a big thing that people don't think about. So like, you know, a lot of public ground or most public ground, you can't trim any limbs. So it takes that little extra thought process and time to get to the area of the tree to where you can actually see and shoot so like having done that before setting your bracket right in that spot knowing you're in the right location and then you know you can't hang your leave your stand up there so you're getting there in the middle of the dark in the morning there's no question you just boom slide it in there hop up and you know when the sun comes up you're going to be in good shape mm -hmm. versus the sun comes up and you're right. You got this giant limb and you're shooting. You <laughs> yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've had that issue. Like I go around and you know, like I'm, I got a spot mapped out. I want to sit and like, I see a tree. Okay. That's the right size. And then I get all the way up there and I'm feeling good. It's still dark. And then the sun starts in the horizon. I'm like, Oh, is that a limb right in my way? Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's just, that's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Right there. And it's always, it's always right in the middle of the trail. And like, there's, and then there's a couple twigs coming out of it to where you 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 can't even like just get around it. It's like yeah, I've had that happen plenty of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anyone that's been in the woods has has had that had that issue sooner or later. So, oh yeah, 
All right, Cody. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your information and, uh, you know, just that unique style of thinking. I know like my biggest takeaway on this is like, don't be afraid to think different and, you know, try something new out there. Complacency is your enemy, you know? Yeah. yeah and, and that's the thing too. Like, uh, you know, thanks for having me, but yeah, if there was one takeaway, it's like, especially, especially if you're having trouble, with what you're doing. I mean, it, you know, that's the big thing. Like if, if you're sitting there racking your brain on what I can do differently or like, Oh man, you know, it's been a couple of years. I just can't seem to get one down. Take a different approach. Look at it from a different angle. Think outside the box and stuff will start working. All right. Great to hear. So, um, for those people that want to, uh, follow along with you or, or hear more of what you've been doing, how do, how do people stay connected or see what's going on? If you want to follow along with what I'm doing, mobile hunting, my tactics, my setups, my style, the best place to do that would be uh, my Instagram profile. It's Cody underscore DeQuisto. Um, throughout the season, I have stories and, and live feeds of my hunting tips and tactics and and you can see a lot of those setups that i implement awesome well uh you know it's been great talking with you and look forward to seeing what you have coming on this upcoming season yeah thanks a lot i it was fun having me on and i'm down to do it again if you want to do it all right perfect we'll have to have a we'll have to have a round two sometime soon yeah sounds good you just heard our conversation with Cody DeQuisto on whitetail strategies and products to help you become more efficient in the field. If you need anything for this upcoming season, make sure to stop by your local store or visit us at shields.com. We're ready to help you get you prepped and ready for the season. And with that, we want to thank you all for listening and see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Shields Outdoors podcast. Stay tuned for future segments and visit our social media pages, Shields Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates.